Shalom, brothers and sisters. This is Dr. William Snubbin coming to you from With One Accord with another in our series of uh, apologetics and, and, in other words, defending the faith, true biblical faith against um, false religious systems. And this time, as you know by the title, we're going to be discussing the founder of the LDS Church, which no longer cares to be called Mormon. <laughs> They've just put out a statement to that effect. And uh, they, they, they prefer to be called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which of course is rather, you know, deceptive because they, they have nothing really to do with the true biblical, you know, Yahushua, Jesus Christ. But that's another discussion for another time. Uh, some of you may know I used to be a Mormon, and that might surprise you, uh, especially looking at me right now, because I look very un-Mormon. But, uh, yeah, I joined the Mormon Church in 1980. And the reason I did it is germane to this. I'm not going to go into the whole story, because, again, I don't want to make this too long. But it's available on several of our, you know... It's on a DVD that is called Mormonism's Temple of Doom. It's available on my website, uh, withoneaccord.org. So, you know, it's out there. P and also, I think it's on the DVD set, uh, Exposing the Illuminati from Within. And it's also on the, uh, the interview with an ex-vampire. So, it's, it's been going around. So, in terms of the Mormons, what happened was, is I was in a place of very deep, dark, stuff because I was a hardcore Satanist and some lady uh, who was a Christian out in San Francisco sent a check back from the bank to me that I had paid a, you know my annual dues so to speak to the Church of Satan to get their newsletter and she wrote on the check I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus well I of course laughed at it but literally, within like 24 hours, my whole life was just shattered. Absolutely shattered. I'm not going to go into all the gory details, but suffice it to say, I was desperate. And I went upstairs to, we had several <clears throat> temples in our house, and I went up into the highest level temple, which was this black, Luciferian, satanic looking thing, and I prayed. And I asked Lucifer for a sign because I'd sold my soul to the devil. You know, I'd done all these things, and here I was. I'd, I'd lost everything, including my occult power. I know now it was because this woman was praying for me and binding all the demons away from me that were giving me power. But I didn't know that then. I was, I was a warlock. I was a high-level, you know, ceremonial magician. And yet one praying lady took me down, hallelujah, through the power of the cross. So anyway, so what happened was is... A couple of days after that, I'd asked for this sign. Um, Mormon missionaries showed up at our door. Now, I'd been told years ago by the Grand Master Druid of North America that if I ever got in deep spiritual trouble, I should join the Mormon Church. And this was in 19, let me think, it was 1973. So this was like seven years earlier. And this guy, who was a very high-level Mason, he was also a Mormon bishop, and he was the supreme druid, you know, high priest for North America. And he told me that I should join the Mormon church if I needed spiritual help, because it was a church, now listen to me, that was founded by witches for witches. Now, I'm sure this is going to stun some of you. Uh, even though I, I put this information out there, literally, 87. 1986, 1987 is when I first shared this material about the LDS Church. I'm going to talk more, more about it in a minute. But, you know, the point is, so I joined the Mormon Church believing it was an organization of white witchcraft. That's what I thought. And I was told by this Druid guy that I should, I should you know, get involved in the church, be very devout, and then go to the temple. Because if you're really worthy, uh, after a year or two, you're allowed to go to the Mormon temple. It's not like they're regular churches where they just meet every Sunday, you know, like most churches do. 
Um, no, it's a special place. There's only, you know, I don't know how many there are in America now. There used to be only 15 or 20 of them, and most of them were in the Rocky Mountain states, you know, which is kind of Mormon country. Well, anyway, long story short, I went to the temple, and I found all these occult and Luciferian and even satanic symbolisms in the temple. And that's what the video and, and my first book, which was also called Mormonism's Temple of Doom, that's what those things were about. Uh, and so the point is, nothing I found in the Mormon church led me to believe that, that the founding people, especially Joseph Smith himself, were anything but witches or sorcerers or warlocks or whatever designation you want to use. And later on, after I got saved in 1984, again, because this lady was praying for me, I started researching these things. Now, mind you, there was no internet back then. You know, this was back in the ancient times. And, but I, I really dug around and I found a lot of interesting stuff. And ultimately, uh, I found a book by a celebrated Mormon historian named D. Michael Quinn, who years ago has been kicked out of the church partially for writing this book. But in that, he documents all the stuff that I'm about to share with you about Joseph Smith. Now, here's the thing. You know, you need, if you're going to follow a prophet, quote unquote, who claims to be a prophet, seer, and revelator. Now, Joseph Smith died in 1844, so we're talking, you know, you know, almost 200 years ago is when the LDS church was started in 1830. So 90, 92 years ago, he started this, this um, goat rodeo, which is really what it is, because even though it's become a very large and powerful organization, it's actually, from the standpoint of the Bible, it is a mess. Now, I'm not going to get into all of that today because it's beyond the scope of this thing. We're talking about Joseph Smith and his character and his life because the Bible makes it very clear that you need to judge a prophet. You can't, oh, somebody comes along, and this is even true today. If someone comes along and says, oh, I'm a prophet of God, you know, and all of that, and his life or his proclamations or his doctrine do not measure up to that, then we're in deep trouble. We don't want to follow that guy. So that being said, let's talk about Joseph Smith. You know, Yahuwah willing, another time I'll do a brief video about the, the doctrines of Mormonism specifically. I'm going to touch on a few of them because, again, the Mormon church in the last generation, you know, has done a, they're very wealthy, and they, they have huge resources, and they've done a lot of advertising. They, of course, they send out missionaries door to door, which is, which is commendable if what they were doing was true. You know, that would be very admirable. But unfortunately, it's not true. But anyhow, they've done a lot to spruce up their image. They went from being regarded, I remember when I was a, a teenager, all I knew about the Mormon church is that they were weird. They were out in Utah. They had a lot of wives, and they had a choir, you know, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. So anyway, um, they now are, there's many churches, I mean, evangelical or mainline churches that basically regard them as essentially Christian. They're, they're welcomed into things like the World Council of Churches, which is, of course, an apostate organization. But, you know, and a lot of the mainline churches are apostate organizations, too. But, you know, so they've really spruced up their image. You know, they had Mitt Romney running for president, you know, um, back in whatever year it was. I think it was 2012, I guess. And thankfully, he didn't win. We have a whole DVD on that called The Throne of Fools. But... Um, and again, beyond the scope of this thing. Uh, let me just talk about Joseph Smith because you will find that there's so much creepy stuff and weirdness in this. And this guy is the root of the Mormon church or the LDS church. Everything springs from him. Even though he claims, of course, it came from Christ, but that's not possible. So let's look at him. Uh, Joseph Smith uh, was born in the early part of the 19th century and um, his parents were of, let's just say, questionable character. 
At the time, they were known, and this is documented, as kind of being ne'er-do-wells. I mean, the father was a what is called a wood scrape, a member of this group called the wood scrape, and basically he did fortune telling and dowsing with wood, hence the name wood scrape, with like a wood, you know, like you've heard, you see these people with forked wooden sticks and they walk around and they claim to find water. Well, that's not really scriptural. So anyway, in fact, there is actually a scripture in one of the prophets, I think it might be Hosea, where it warns about people who ask questions of stocks and wood. You know, not good. So anyway, and then his mother, Lucy Mack Smith, his father was Joseph Smith Sr., so the man in question is known officially as Joseph Smith Jr., um, she wrote in her book, a book that was written, that, that they, they actually cast magic circles in the family and they, they cultivated the faculty of abrac. Now, you might think, well, what the heck is that? Well, that's um, a short version of the word abracadabra which most people know is kind of a word that's associated with wizards and magic and, you know, poof, abracadabra. And, of course, a slightly different version of that word was used in the popular Harry Potter books and movies. But anyway, so they were into the occult. His parents were into the occult. And those of you that understand the spiritual dynamics here, uh, they were not, you know, they were not in any way godly people. And that means that Joseph that was born... Uh, along with his his two brothers, with a disadvantage. Spiritually, the, his parents were not, they might have been nominal Christians in the sense that they went to church every once in a great while, but not at all. You know, they were not devout Christians, and obviously if they were practicing the occult, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't good Christians. <clears throat> so anyway, so Joseph Smith, when he got to be older and a teenager, he started out kind of following in his daddy's footsteps. And he was out running around uh, claiming to find buried treasure. And he claimed he could do it with this seer stone. Uh, you know, and, and he'd charge money for this. Because, see, there, at that time there was this folklore. This was all taking place in, in and around Palmyra, New York. So it was on the East Coast. And there was this folklore going around that... Uh, Pirates, I think Blackbeard maybe, but some famous pirates had left behind treasure somewhere to be dug up later and then they were, you know, killed by the British or something. And so they, um, they the, the treasure was still there. And Joseph Smith and his son, Joseph Smith Jr., both claimed they could find this treasure for a fee. Well, they'd go and, and it's a whole thing and I don't want to get into all the details. Suffice it to say... It was a very disreputable way for a young man to earn his living. In fact, he was arrested. He was arrested, this is again documented, and charged with being a basically a con man and a glass looker, quote unquote. Now that, that was an old fashioned word for someone who would look, you know, they'd have a crystal ball and he'd look in a crystal ball and claim to see stuff in it, okay? I used to have a crystal ball too, you know, when I was a witch. So. I understand how these things work. And, and he would claim that he would look in this, this stone, this seer stone, and that he would, you know, be able to find buried treasure. And then they'd go and they'd dig, and then, you know, th there'd be no treasure, of course. And so he'd say, oh, well, the evil spirits <clears throat> moved the treasure. This was a common way of belief. These People were pretty superstitious. And of course, none of this is in the scripture. So anyhow, that was a story of how Joseph Smith got his start. Now, a little later in life, <clears throat> not much, I mean, you know, he, he claims that he found a, um, or was led by an angelic visitor to, to find, uh, appeared in his bedroom, to find uh, a box with golden plates in it that had this, it was kind of jokingly called the Golden Bible. They were thin plates of gold, and on it were written a whole set of scriptures <clears throat> that were unknown to the rest of Judaism or Christianity at the time, and they were written in Reformed Egyptian, I think it was. So it couldn't be translated. Well, anyway, he claimed that he could translate this by the gift and power of God. 
and he claimed that he would look in this, he'd had a, he had a stovepipe or some kind of a top hat, you know, and he'd put this, this rock <clears throat> in, the, in the bottom of the hat and he'd put his face in the hat. Yes, I'm not making this up. Mormons believe this. And he put his face in the hat and he would look at this stone and the letters would glow on the stone and he would be able to translate them. And he had a couple of different men that would come and they'd help. He'd read the letters, supposedly, and they would transcribe them. Well, there's so many holes in this story that I don't have time to go into. My point is, again, he is using occult power to do this. This is not anything you'll ever, you're ever going to see in the scriptures, either testament. So let's just go on. Um... Uh, there's a lot of occult stuff around us that defended this angel would only appear on a witch holiday, September 21st, which oddly enough is tomorrow. As I'm filming this, I'm filming this on September 20th. <clears throat> and anyway, one year he actually was afraid he couldn't do it because his brother Alvin was supposed to help. And his brother Alvin unexpectedly died. And so... This was a big thing because magic is very precise, supposedly, and he needed to get everything right. So he literally, he went and did a necromantic ritual. Now, what's necromancy? It's when you do magic over the dead. <clears throat> and he, he went to the cemetery where his brother's body was interred, and he dug up the body. And this has been documented by several historians. And basically cut off, I think it was the guy's finger, so, and then he could use that finger and the, the magical virtue in that finger and see, this is all necromancy, which is forbidden in the Torah and also in the New Testament. And he supposedly went and used that finger of his dead brother to conjure up this angel. Well, anyway, that, that's one of the most disreputable things he ever did. He also uh, would, would do things like he'd cast a magic circle in the night, you know, out somewhere on a hill and he'd take a black goat or a black sheep and cut its throat and then let it walk around in the circle, you know, and, and trace the, um, the occult circle he'd already put down there in its blood until it finally, you know, collapsed from, you know, blood loss. So really creepy stuff. And, you know, he also taught in his, at first the church, the Mormon church that he started, started out as kind of just a sort of odd form of Protestantism, except for the fact that it claimed that the entire Christian church had apostatized, like about, you know, back in the third century, and that Joseph Smith was selected by heaven to restore it. That's why they call him a prophet, seer, and revelator. So anyway, at first, there, you know, if you read the Book of Mormon, which I don't recommend you do, but you'll find that there's not a lot in it, except that it's very boring, but there's not a lot in the Book of Mormon <clears throat> that sounds particularly bizarre. All that stuff came later. Because Joseph Smith started coming out with his own revelations in a second volume of their holy scripture that's called Doctrine and Covenants. Well, anyhow... He started teaching things like, for example, that God is not a spirit, that God the Father has a body, a body and parts and passions. And he taught that God has a, a wife, and they're up there having celestial sex and producing spiritual babies, which come down here onto the earth plane to be born, to go through life and, and you know, earn their salvation. This is Mormon doctrine. This is called the law of eternal progression. That God was once a man who worked his way up to Godhood, and now we are born into this world as spirit babies from Heavenly Father and, and the Mother, or a Mother, because God is actually a polygamist up there. <clears throat> I mean, the next time you see Mormon missionaries, and they look so nice and wholesome and squeaky clean and their nice suits and white shirts and all of that, just remember that even though those young men are probably very earnest and very sincere, good young guys, or they send out young girls too, you know, they're peddling spiritual filth. They really are. Now, because everything I'm telling you is totally documented. Um, anyway, so that's one of the things they teach, and that's, of course, a very common doctrine in, um, in the occult, that man can become a god. 
Okay, then you have the, the fact that he taught toward the end of his life that, that devout Mormons needed to go to the temple, go through all of these kind of quasi-Masonic occult rituals. Again, I don't have time to go into that right now, but it's on the DVD, Mormonism's Temple of Doom. Um, to go through all this stuff, and then they get to wear magic underwear for the rest of their lives. They're called sacred temple garments, and they're never supposed to take them off. They have to sleep in them. They have to have marital relations in them because there's, you know, little, you know, openings for that. But, and they even have to bathe in them. They have to, like, you know, like the, my, my mentor uh, in my early days was Ed Decker, uh, he basically taught me a lot of what I know about ministry, and, and he used to say, because he was a former Mormon, that he would, when he took a bath, he would dangle his foot over the edge of the bathtub with a temple garment on the toe, and he'd wash himself up, and then he'd get out of the bath, and right there would be a fresh temple garment, because you're allowed to have more than one, and he, he stepped into the new temple garment as soon as he dried himself off, and that way he was never without his temple garment, ever, and they believed it had a cult power, and these temple garments, and again, this is all Joseph Smith, these temple garments had Masonic markings on the, the two breasts and also on the navel and on the knee because the, the garments go all the way down to the knee. Uh, they're like kind of like if it's a one piece, think of like a one-piece old-fashioned swimsuit, except, of course, they're white. The, they cover you to the knee and they cover you to the elbow and um, never supposed to take them off. So that's a, a totally an occult idea. It's superstitious because they believe there was a Mormon, uh, high-level Mormon that used to tell stories, which turned out to be all lies. But anyway, he told, he said that when he was in World War II in the Pacific, that, that a tank rolled over him. And because he had his temple garment on, the tanks, um, the treads, you know, they shattered. And he was totally unharmed, even though this, you know, five ton or whatever tank rolled over him. So, you know, this is what they believe. And again, that's like kind of like a rabbit's foot. It's a good luck charm. And, but that's what you're given to wear. And again, this is Joseph Smith's teaching. So the other thing is he taught polygamy as necessary for salvation. And, you know, and he himself... At the time of his martyrdom, he was well, kind of a martyr. I mean, he was shot and killed uh, in Carthage jail by a mob. And, and some of the, the more dark, humorous people at the time claimed that he was, the guys that were shooting him were either Freemasons because he gave away their secrets without warrant, or it was all the wives of the, of the pardon me, the husbands of the wives he'd stolen. Because at the time of his death, he had at least 27 wives and Yahuwah knows how many concubines. Uh, so, you know, and, and of course the Mormon church was kind of forced by the United States government around 1891, I think it was, to, to kind of put the, the doctrine of polygamy, plural marriage on hold. So officially they no longer do it. They haven't done it for, you know, over, I guess it'd be a hundred years. But let me tell you, and I could do another thing on that, but I'm not going to. Uh, they still do it, they just do it in secret. They keep it kind of off the books, so to speak. Anyway, the final thing is, is that when Joseph was murdered, as I mentioned, they took his body, you know, to the, to the morgue or whatever it was at that time. And it, again, this is documented. They discovered that in his pocket, he had a Jupiter talisman. Now, what may you ask is that? Well, a Jupiter talisman is like a coin, and there's these occult, high, this is high-level magic. This isn't just like a rabbit's foot. This is stuff out of the greater key of Solomon, or the lesser key of Solomon, or the black pullet. These are all medieval magical workbooks that are very powerful and very dangerous. I used to own all of them. And they're, they're like textbooks for doing black magic. And this particular, <clears throat> excuse me, this particular little coin had sigils, they were called sigils, and, you know, hopefully I'll have a picture of one up on the screen uh, for you to look at. But anyway, the deal is that this coin was designed, number one, to give him sex, uh, pardon me, uh, success with women. And number two, it was designed to give him power 
to assume political office because at the time of his murder, he was actually running for president of the United States. He had his own army. It was called the Nauvoo Legion. And again, this was in the middle of the 1840s, and he was, he was the most powerful political figure in Illinois at that time because his city, Nauvoo, where the Mormons had settled, was actually bigger at that time than Chicago. So anyway, he had this occult talisman in his possession when he died. Not only that, it is reported, the Mormons don't, they change what he said, but that his last words were as he, as he was shot and fell out the window was, oh Lord my God, is there no help for the widow's son? which is a Masonic incantation because Joseph Smith was also a high-level Mason. So, all of this makes for a very disreputable thing in terms of the Bible because you can't, I mean, he, because he would actually take other men's wives for himself. And that's totally unscriptural. That's adultery, which in the days of the Torah was a stoning offense. And, you know, all these occult things he was doing, all of this stuff, plus he taught a bunch of weird doctrines. This all makes it highly unlikely that he was a prophet of any kind. And now let's go to the Bible. What is the Bible? The Bible has ways we can tell if someone is a true prophet. And, you know, first we go to Deuteronomy 13, where we read this in the very first verse. Um... If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spoke and said unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not, notice that, thou shalt not hearken to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for Yahweh your Elohim proveth you to know whether you love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul. And ye shall walk after Yahweh your Elohim and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from Yahweh your Elohim, etc., etc., so, he's supposed to be put to death. Now, the other passage you want to go to is in the same book, Deuteronomy, last book in the Torah, in Deuteronomy 18, but we start in verse 20. And we read, But the prophet, which I pr shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that speak in the name of other Elohim, other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thy heart, how shall we know the word which Yahweh hath not spoken? Here's the answer, verse 22. When a prophet speaketh in the name of Yahweh, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which Yahweh hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. Okay, now, let's examine Joseph Smith in the light of these two passages of Scripture. First of all, he led people to follow other Elohim, other gods, because we understand, you know, Yahushua said that God is a spirit. That's pretty clear. But yet the Mormons say that Joseph Smith taught that God is like a guy with all the pertinent plumbing <clears throat> and that he has a body, parts, and passions. In other words, the Mormon God is basically like an extraterrestrial super being who cannot be in more than one place at one time, by the way. So, that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not at all. Because he was a spiritual being, and it says very clearly, again, in both Testaments, that nobody can see the Father and live. Okay? So, right there, that makes him a false prophet. But if you look at the other thing, in Deuteronomy 18, because, you know, there can be false prophets, according to Deuteronomy 13, there can be false prophets that still say things and they come to pass. Because you know as well as I do, there are, there are psychics and there are false prophets out there, and every now and then they get something right. 
but you have to measure their doctrine. What do they teach? And Joseph Smith's doctrine is so far off the charts of biblical, you know, faith that it's it's like in a whole other planet, literally the planet Koblob, which they, that's another part of their teaching, is that God lives on a planet called Kolob. So anyway, it's just bizarre. Now, the other thing, though, in Deuteronomy 18 is it says, if the prophet speaketh a word and he claims it's coming from Yahuwah, and the thing does not come to pass, then that prophet shall die. That prophet is a false prophet. Now, here's the thing about Joseph Smith. This could be a whole separate teaching, and it probably will be. But Joseph Smith made many, many, many false prophecies. In fact, dozens of them. You know, an obvious example would be that, that, the, um, that the great celestial temple would be built in Missouri before he died. That never happened. That's just one example. There are all sorts of them. And, and I, I, like I say, I'll probably do a, a video on that at some future time. But the point is, only one false prophecy makes a man or a woman a false prophet. And you should no longer listen to that individual. That's the Torah. That's the scriptures. And so, therefore, everything that proceedeth out of Joseph Smith's mouth, all these scriptures, and even, and I mind you, the Mormon church is a highly successful church. <clears throat> they're huge. They have million, I think there are 10 or 11 at least million members. I don't really keep track of it anymore. And most of them are very nice people. They have good Christian values in the sense that they're, they're conservative, they're pro-life, they're pro-chastity you know chastity before marriage. All of that's fine. But what I want everybody to remember as I close this video is Mormonism and all these other false religions is like rat poison. It's spiritual rat poison. How so? Well, it's 95% okay and 5% poison. That's what rat poison is. It's 95% good food that the rats will like, otherwise the rats won't eat it. But it's the 5% that kills the rats, and it's the 5% of false LDS Mormon doctrines that will kill you spiritually if you join the Mormon church. Now, I got out of the Mormon church in 1984, and I, I never looked back because I could never achieve what I really craved in life, which was fellowship with Yahushua, which was the ability to walk in righteousness and in holiness and have victory in my life. I never got that as a Mormon. And that's because the more you can't give away what you don't have. The whole Mormon church, although it looks really good, it's a facade, it's a fake. And again, I'm not attacking the individual people. They're, like I say, for the most part, wonderful individuals. But the leadership of the Mormon church was then and is now highly corrupt. And if you don't believe me, uh, there's a video. We don't, we don't have to sell it, but there's a video out there that Ed Decker did years ago. It's called God Makers 2. And you should check it out if you don't believe what I'm telling you. And from my own experience, I was in the Mormon church for five years. I was an elders quorum president. I was very devoted to the, uh, to the faith. And I actually was a professional teacher of religion for the church educational system for one year. So I was deeply in it. And I realized if I wanted to follow Jesus, Yahushua, I had to leave the Mormon church. And so I did. And that's, that's another story I don't want to talk about right now. But that's basically what I have for you today. And I want you to realize, folks, again, I'm not ta attacking the Mormon people, but their church basically is a pack of lies. Gift wrapped to look real nice, but it's spiritual poison. And if you are a Mormon, I'll just say this, if you're watching this and you're a Mormon, you need to leave the church, you need to get born again, according to the Bible. And we have how to do that on our website at withoneaccord.org. And you need to renounce the church. You need to have your name taken off the church rolls. We have a letter how to do that that you can just print out and, and tweak it a little bit the way you want it and send it to your, your bishop or your stake president, depending on what, what level of authority you are in the church. You need to get out of it. You need to get deliverance from the evil spirits that are part of the Mormon church, especially if you've been to the temple. Because the temple is highly occultic, believe me. 
because before I was a Mormon, I was a witch. So I had a unique perspective when I went to the Salt Lake Temple in 1981. So all that being said, uh, I pray that this has been helpful. If, if any of you know people, family members or neighbors that are either Mormons or thinking of joining the Mormon church, share this video with them because I can document everything I've said. I have copies of my temple recommend of my baptismal certificate in the Mormon church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in Milwaukee Second Ward back in 1981, I think it was. It's all there. Everything I'm saying is true, and the Mormon church is a big lie. So, I hope this has been a blessing. We really invite you to subscribe and share, uh, as I said a moment ago. And, and again, if, you, if you're interested in, we try to come out with one of these videos every week. Uh, so if you hit the bell, you will get a, um, a thing from YouTube telling you the video is up. And uh, again, please pray for us. And also please pray about uh, supporting our ministry because we're an entirely faith-based ministry. We have not monetized this channel. And uh, we, just, we just need your prayers and we need your support. And we thank you and we pray this has been a blessing to you. And uh, just have a blessed week. Shalom, shalom.